Okay, so great. It's nice to, uh, nice to have you all with us today on this election day. Thanks for joining us. We had uh, 60 folks um, register for the webinar, so it looks like this is a topic that lots of people are interested in. I'm doing this webinar at the request of um, folks who have said in particular for 6th and 7th grade, racial and proportion was a big topic that um, they wanted to, to hear about and to learn more about in terms of different kinds of um, tools to help students understand racial and proportion and build understanding that would lead us to the slope. So um, that's why we're here today. Hopefully Alan Maloney will join us soon. He is at the Friday Institute at NC State University and he along with his team members and uh, Jared Comfrey have developed um, materials uh, uh, that I'm going to highlight today and he'll be around also, thank goodness, to answer lots of questions um, if you have questions. So we'll try to leave some time at the end for questions and um, I will go ahead and get started then. So if I can advance my slide. I'm going to get out of this just real quick. Okay, so the goals for the session are to work through some mathematics. We're going to um, look at some examples, like I said, from the turn on ccmath.net site and from a couple of other resources, and we'll actually work through the math and think about um, various solution methods and representations for the problem. And we'd like to also share some web resources related to the topics. So it's, it's a small focus in terms of, um, I don't want to do you know, a ton of examples, but I want to do a couple of examples where we focus on various representations and think um, together what those representations might um, yield in terms of benefits for understanding. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with an example from the Turn On CC Math um, website, and we'll look at that website um, more in depth later. And like I said, we'll have Alan here with us to answer questions about those materials. So this is a, an adapted problem um, that I just grabbed from their materials. It says, suppose my favorite lemonade recipe calls for eight lemons um, and 12 cups of sugar water, but what we want to know is how much sugar water will I need if I only have two lemons and I want to make my lemonade that tastes, the lemonade that tastes like my favorite recipe. So we're going to take just a minute to uh, write down some solutions and uh, think about the different kinds of representations and then we'll list those representations and talk a little bit about those, uh, the specific representations that you guys will use. So. As you think about those, if you want to go ahead and chat some of those um, ideas in the chat box, um, Carol is monitoring the chat box for me. And think about how your students would, would try to answer this question. And then Carol's going to let me know what some of those are. Because uh, Actually, I can look at the chat window too. So feel free to chime in. I'm encouraging everybody to, to uh, use the chat feature since we have to mute your microphone so that we don't get the feedback. And then later on, I'll pass control, as questions come in, I'll pass control over to Alan so that um, he, can, he, can answer some, I mean, he can answer some questions. So we have somebody here. Students just divide by four. Just divide by four. Pass the recipe, then half it again. Use pictures of lemons and cups and, and cups to represent the problems. These are great. Basic solution can be found by drawing a model and circling groups. Lots of different ways to look at this. This is awesome. 8 divided by 12 equals 2 over x. So somebody jumped right to the algebraic representation. And if you want to send your um, answers, you can send them to me privately, but you can also, under the send to box, there's a pull down menu and if instead of choosing my name or the presenter, you can choose everyone and then that way everybody can see your responses. So I think the reason I'm not seeing those responses is because you're sending them to Carol.
So the, the specific responses we've gotten so far are um, specific to this problem. Could we think about kind of representations, and some of you have mentioned these too, kind of bigger picture representations, like the idea of um, using pictures of lemons and cups to represent the problem. A T-chart, Leah, Leah, you said there's a T-chart. I'm not familiar with the T-chart. Are you thinking about um, uh, actually a, a table where you fill in the values for each? Okay, great. So we'll think about a, a table of those particular values. Any other suggestions? Okay, so let's look at some let's look at some of these these suggestions that we've gotten. And on the next slide, what I have is I've actually um, made a list. Sorry, I've made a list of some of the things that you guys decide you you guys suggested. And this is what um, I'm going to think about just looking at the relationship from a table. I think that's what we meant by a T chart. So if we need eight lemons, we'll need 12 cups of sugar water. That was the original idea. Somebody said have it, so we'd have four lemons to six cups of sugar water and have it again, and so we get our answer of three cups of sugar water. So this is what we might uh, call, somebody said call it a T-chart or just a ratio table where you're just li listing these values, and it depends on what values you think about as you move through the table, whether or not you might hit your answer, right? So, for example, if I said instead I don't really just have two lemons, I have three lemons and I want to use all three, then this chart that I have here um, won't answer the question for me. Um, if you look at this, we can think about the, the um, pattern across the columns and that's called correspondence. So the number of lemons to the um, cups, number of cups of sugar water or across between the rows. So that's called co-variation as we think about here we doubled it from 8 to 16, so we doubled this 12 to 24. So I want to um, include something in here called a bridging standard, and we're going to talk uh, more specifically about the standards yet later, but what I wanted to do was include this bridging standard that's included in the Turn On CC um, math materials because it talks about something that we'll use later on, something known as a ratio unit versus a unit ratio. So I want to just kind of put that language on the table. The ratio unit describes the smallest whole number pair that represents the ratio. So that would be like the littlest recipe. So in our case, if we look down the list here, this is our littlest recipe where these two are going to be whole numbers. And then the unit ratio is a ratio that describes a relationship where one of the uh, parts of the ratio is a one. So, for example, if we have one lemon to three half cups of water, if we go down here, one lemon to three half cups of sugar water, that's called a unit ratio, but it's arbitrary as to which one I put first, right? I could talk about the, um, the number of lemons to sugar water, in which case I'd say two thirds of the lemon. I'm not sure if we could cut, I guess we could work on cutting two thirds of the lemon, and then to, sh to one cup of sugar water. So these will be important because, for example, um, later on we can think about if we could get back to that unit ratio, then we can solve lots of problems if we understand the unit ratio. Also, it will come into play later on when we talk about slope and unit rate. So I wanted to put that on the table so we can go back to the problem and think about some other representations. Here's one. If I decide to graph, uh, nobody suggested graphing, but if I decide to graph these on a coordinate plane where I put the number of lemons along the horizontal axis and the number of cups of sugar water on the vertical axis, and then I can plot some of those points in my table. So, for example, here I have that two, num two lemons to three cups of sugar water, and then here four to six, and here was the original recipe, eight lemons to 12 cups of sugar water. So if I think about this graphical representation, um, it's, it's kind of interesting because when we're comparing these items in lots of these problems, we're comparing two different items. So it kind of makes sense to go from that, that table to building this graphical representation, and it'll help us later think about slope. If there are questions or comments, please stop, 
stop me and uh, or just put something in the chat window and and Carol will stop me. So if you think about graphing these, you'll notice that the coordinates of the first lattice point, that is if I look at my graph, this is my first lattice point, that is where the coordinates are integer values here, 2, 3, makes up my ratio unit. So again, the ratio unit versus unit ratio might be a little bit confusing that language. The ratio unit is that littlest recipe, whereas the unit ratio is where one of these particular values is a 1. So you can see that represented on the graph. I circle that unit, that ratio unit there. And this is the graph that I took from the Turn On CC Math um, materials because it talks about how you can, you can also see this unit ratio, either way you represent it, one to three halves or the two two thirds to one on the graph if you're talking about number of lemons where the number of lemons is the unit one and you're trying to figure out how much sugar water then here's this blue one here I got one here and this is three halves versus if I want the cups of sugar water to be one how many lemons would I need that's when this value here is one I go over here and I figure out that that's two thirds Okay, so that students also learn to associate the horizontal line segment of change with the increase in the number of lemons and the vertical line segment of change with the increase in the cups of sugar water. So when you look at this, these horizontal line segments, if I increase the number of lemons, what will it mean in terms of cups of sugar water? Same increase here. That increase by two, then I need to increase the number of cups of sugar water by three, which was the original question was, if I had two lemons, how many cups of sugar water will I need? Carol, you get over there? So that's just the different representations. We had the table, we had the graphical representation, and then somebody did set up an equation, which I'll talk a little bit about later too. But I also want to introduce the idea of double number lines, or maybe not introduce it, maybe other people are familiar with this idea. Can you let me know in the chat box if you've seen the idea of double or the representation of double number lines? That's Maybe you could raise your hand and then I think I can look at that and see who's raising their hand. I just haven't seen that. Okay. And there's some questions here. Forgive me for kind of stepping outside of the picture. Is there a reason for showing the steps below the line instead of above? Are you talking about the double number line? Let me go back up. Who was it, guys? Oh, can I see it? Very bright. Very. Okay, so let's go back to the previous graph. Oops, sorry. And Barry, your question is, is there a reason? Let me go back to your question, sorry. Is there a reason for showing the steps below the line instead of above the line? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't know. I didn't create this graph. I usually think of uh, drawing them below. Alan, do you have an answer to that one? So he's asking yeah. instead of... This is private. Oh. Alan, if you can send me to send it, send it to all, then we can see your answer. There it is. Could be either more a matter of convention. Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, I thought of it as below the line too, because it might just be what I'm used to. If we got to go with rise over run, it would be above. Susie, Susie suggested that. So if I go rise over run, yeah, I'm going up three and over two. Yep. Good question. Thanks for asking it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about num double number lines unless there's some other questions about the previous line. Okay, so um, for double number lines, the reason I'm talking about it is because if uh, you look at the Common Core standards, the, um, they talk about representing ratio in terms of these different representations, in terms of the graphical representation in ratio tables. We're going to talk about something called ratio boxes double number lines, and even something else called tape diagrams. So 
So that was one of the reasons I think folks wanted me to do this webinar, is to talk about all those different rep representations. Alan's got another answer here. The, the issue of rides first always confuses many people representing triangles. Oh, yeah, so later on we'll talk about um, the slope triangles. Actually, that, I don't know that I'll talk about it today, but in, in um, the turn on CC math material. Yeah, and then, and when that, what Diane is saying, we typically, typically go to the x value before the y value, which creates the steps below. That's what I was thinking of. If you change the number of lemons, how will that change the uh, sugar water? So if I go back here, I say, if I change the number of lemons here, how much sugar water will I need? That also could be um, a, a function of um, what question we're trying to answer. If instead I would have said, if I have this much sugar water prepared, what would I need in terms of the number of lemons, in which case I might swap the horizontal and vertical axes to. So I thought about it this way. If I move along the horizontal axis two units, how much sugar water will I need? Okay. So let's uh, go back, I think, to the double number lines. And what I'm going to do is I've created these two lines. The top one represents the number of lemons, and the bottom one represents the cups of sugar water. And what I've marked is that my recipe, my basic recipe, the one I think is so tasty, is 8 lemons to 12 cups of sugar water. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to escape out of here and go to someplace I can write on. I have a OneNote file here with my graphics because I can write on it using my stylus. It's a little bit easier than escaping out of the PowerPoint. So what you normally do with what I've seen with these um, double number lines is I have these two lines straight up on top of each other because that's my basic recipe. So if I think about if I only have if I only have two lemons, that was the original question. How much sugar water will I need? Well, somebody said I could just divide by four. So if I divide this top length by four here, then how much would each of these be? This would be two, right? So from here to here, I just divide by four. And I do the similar, the same operation straight under here to get my new amount, divide by four. And that would give me three lines. Okay, so that's one way to use double number lines. Not the only way. The other way I've seen it is to think about the um, unit ratio. I got that straight because unit is the first word in unit ratio, which means that one of one piece of my ratio will be one. So if I have something to something else, one of these has to, has to be a one. So that helps me remember which is a unit ratio versus a ratio unit. So if I think about the unit ratio, instead of doing what I just did, get rid of that, get rid of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, if I want to get to one lemon, so if I get to one lemon, did I do that right? Yep, this is one. To get to one from eight, I divide by eight. Now, that hasn't answered my question yet, but I can at least get to what the equivalent measurement is here, straight down here for my sugar water. I'm going to divide by 8. Which will give me 3 halves. But I don't want to answer how many lemons, I mean, how much water do I need for one lemon. I want to answer the question, so there's one here. Sorry, I covered it up with my arrow. I want to now think about how I get to two lemons. So I'm dividing by eight on the bottom, but multiplying by two here. So I'll do the same thing on the bottom number line. I divided by eight here. That was the top. That was my first operation. Uh, you know, corresponding to the top number line. And now I'm going to take this three halves and multiply it by two. So I get the three halves multiplied by two, and that gives me my three cups of lemon. So that's what corresponds, I mean, uh, sugar water, sorry. That's what corresponds there. So that's one way to use 
two ways to use the double number line. If you're fortunate enough to get the question, oh, if I have two lemons, then I can just divide both, both by four. Or I can get back to my unit ratio and then use the unit ratio from there. So Alan's got a bunch there, a uh, bunch of information. Let's look at what he's got. And Alan, I'm Alan, you, oh, sorry. Alan, do you want, do you want to, um, to answer some of these questions as they come up, or would you rather wait until the end? You can just let me know. Okay, so he said whichever. He's, he's kind of giving me some information as I go along, thinking about how we can represent that. So it might make sense just, um, let's go ahead and give you the, the um, microphone. So we're going to, this is going to be a test. We're going to give Alan the microphone because he's got some good suggestions as we think about the problem. Okay, can you And then um, I'm, I will mute my, my system when I give it to you. So you've given him control? Um, Carol's going to give you control, Alan, so you okay. can talk. I've unmuted it at this end. Let me know when you can hear me. Uh, there we go. Okay, I'll, you can even see me if you want. You may not want to, who knows. Um, yeah, I was just um, making the point that when you have that representation, that double line representation, the way Maria just drew it, um, I always look at these thing, these representations as a model of the situation, and so that model really uh, gives you certain affordances, a nice way of thinking about it is that it takes whatever proportion you started with and you scale both sets of units to the same size so that when you do a um, an equal partitioning of both, um, both quantities, you're actually partitioning the line segment exactly the same way and then you draw your vertical lines and that shows you uh, for each number exactly where the where the new proportion is for the same ratio and that that's kind of nice now it does not show you a real a true two dimensional representation of the ratio uh, that you're working with so that um, that two dimensional representation gives you certain other affordances of it and I think it's always important that kids be able to reason kids and teachers for that matter uh, are able to reason with multiple different representations and understand what they show and what they don't show or uh, what they hide, what they reveal. Okay, so we're going to thank you, Alan, for that. Sure. But yeah, feel free to um, let us know when you want to kind of chime in there. It's we'll very do. useful. So, Carol's just giving me control again. <laughs> no. She's going to pass the ball. Okay. Okay, am I sure about this one? No. Okay, no. Okay, great. So, so this is just it was kind of an interesting representation um, that I hadn't seen before until so somebody said, well, you know, can you help us think about the um, double number line? And then I have a different example that we'll look at later using the um, ratio tables and the double number line. And then, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we have this idea of using a double number line for our recipe. And then this is an, um, an interesting idea, too. These are called ratio boxes. And um, this, is too, is from the Turn On CC math materials. So it's a, another bridging standard. And for the, those particular standards, they always give you the rationale for introducing this, these bridging standards. And they talk about using a ratio box to describe the relationship and explain how to move multiplicatively between the two quantities and within the two quantities. So when we looked at our table before, we had several values listed in our table, and that might be something that the kids do. They just create various, you know, ver uh, lots of different values depending on the particular question they're going to try to answer until they get to their, their answer. Um, but if I lift 
any two consecutive rows from that previous table, I create this ratio box. But then what I'm doing is trying to think about the relationship between the two quantities here across the columns. So that's what the correspondent says. So here's one way to think about it. It's not the only way to think about it. We could, how do I get from 8 to 12? I could multiply by 3. I get 24 and divide by 2. And then here's the same, same thing. The same correspondent holds true between 16 and 24. Multiply by 3, divide by 2, and I get the 24. So that's the correspondent. If I look down from one row to the next, Within the two quantities, I say, well, how do I get 16 from 8? I multiply by 2. How do I get 24 from 12? That, that's, um, that's also true. I multiply by 2. Um, now, again, kind of depending on where the kids are in terms of their operations and um, you know what they can do here, I was talking to somebody else about this, and they said, well, is it complicated to do two operations to multiply by 3 and then divide by 2? Can I think of that? as just multiplying by three halves, and again, it depends on the facility of the students with that type of operation. So could we multiply by one and a half? Yes, that's certainly true. We can multiply by one and a half. So this idea of ratio, the ratio box is, is interesting because it kind of, it helps you focus on just two rows of your ratio table, and it identifies these relationships here. So I'm sure Alan will have um, more to say about that either now or later in terms of how, how to use these ratio boxes. Um, so for example, with ours, somebody said, well, I could divide by 2 or divide by 4, so I get from, go from 8, and if I change the 16 to 2, then the question would be, if I have 8 and 12 and 2 here, what goes in the missing spot? So let's go back out <coughs> to my OneNote file, and let's just draw that ratio box with the original question. <laughs> Excuse me. So if I draw my ratio box here, and I have lemons, I have lemons here, sugar water here. This is my original recipe. My question was, if I have a two here, what will go here? And somebody actually answered the question setting up an equation. Um, if I go back, let me see if I can go back to the chat window. Okay, sorry. Now, some, somehow I muted my audio by accident. I apologize for that. So I was just going back to the idea that somebody wanted to set up this equation, 8 divided by 12 equals 2 divided by x. Thank you for that suggestion. But what I was thinking about was if you have the algebraic skills to solve this, this is a fine way to do this, and this is what many students do at kind of a later stage. But if you think about the, the skills required to solve this equation, it can be tricky. Kids get confused. You have to you have to think about, uh, you know, how do I want to solve this? Do I want to multiply both sides by x? Do I want to cross multiply? That kind of idea. So this can be a pretty sophisticated way to solve this problem. Whereas if I just think about it from a numerical standpoint, even just the list of values and trying to come up with the answer based on if I have two lemons specifically, how do I answer that question? But if I, I can, I think I, that kind of removes that difficulty, that level of difficulty. Um, so the other thing that I think that makes this a little bit challenging is that it, it is arbitrary how I set this up in terms of do I say x, x over 2 is the same thing as 12 over 8. This equation could be much easier to solve because my unknown's in the numerator, 
versus this one that could be a little bit trickier. But again, if we have a facility with the algebra, um, it's not an issue. At a, at a younger age, I imagine that this would, um, this is where we're going eventually. But the table and the ratio tables, I think, are a nice way to think about it. So, um, uh, Alan has just said one of the strengths of the ratio box with one unknown is that students quickly see that you can get to the unknown via multiplication and or division vertically or horizontally. They can also eventually re recognize how to set up an equation like that one and, eventual, and eventually why the cross multiplication even has even as far as uh, generating proof. So yeah, they can understand why that works, that cross multiplication in terms of generating proof. So that's a great, great point. In fact, once we get our answer here, again, you have the, you have the, um, the choice, right? You can say, well, how do I get from here to here? I divided by four. I can do the same thing here for this particular example. If I get my three. And notice when you multiply across the diagonal, you get the same thing, which is really leading us to that idea that I can say 8 divided by 12 is the same thing as 2 over x. I'm going to really eventually say this was my x, 8x equals 24. So 8x equals 24 is ultimately the equation we'll solve once we set up those ratios. And it, it could be a little bit harder to get to depending on which way you set it up. Uh, I got another comment, but the ratio box also helps them see different ways to set up the same proportion. Yeah, I really love this idea of the ratio box when I thought of it. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I think we'll um, keep going. I'm going to do a different example. And uh, Carol, are you going to? Are you going to show my movie for me? We got a movie for you to watch, just a really short one. Um, so let me present the problem, and then Carol's going to take over and show the movie. This is from a um, a Dan Meyer video. Sorry, we'll go back to those questions in just a minute. This is a Dan Meyer video that was on a, um, a website that Susan Shell shared with me. The Live Finder site, and I have that in my list of resources. And it talked about his nana. Dan Meyer has a nana, and she likes her chocolate milk just right. And her recipe for just right means four scoops of chocolate to one scup, uh, cup of milk. So that's her. That's the perfect um, chocolate milk for nana. And then if Carol can share her screen, she's going to show you the video. Although you might not be able to hear it. I can meet if you want to know. You don't really know. Okay. So I just had um, Carol show you the video because I thought it, I thought it was a. Uh, I like I like that movie. I don't know why I like that movie, but I like that movie of, of Dan. Maybe it's because he's making chocolate milk for Zana. I thought that was kind of nice. Um, and so, what the question is, how to fix? How do you help Dan fix the problem? Um, and so, if you so if you think about this in the diff, different rep representations, we've thought about we could make a table. We could make our ratio table, and we know the perfect recipe is four scoops of chocolate to one cup of milk. And if you just start Filling your ratio table, and again, I think this is 
what kids do sometimes, they just start thinking about, well, what if I double the number of scoops? Well, I don't know that I, I want to make two whole cups of milk, but if I double the number of scoops, then I know that eight scoops, two cups of milk would be one thing that would fix, fix the problem. If I use as many as 12, then I'd, need, I'd make three cups of milk, and that would seem like over the top too much milk for Nana. Or if you go all the way to 12, this is what they call building up these tables in the turn on CC math materials. You build up your table, and then you can start thinking about dividing. Now that I've got 12, what if I divided by two? Then I could say, oh, well, this isn't such a bad solution. If I had six scoops, and Stan made the mistake of putting five scoops in there, if I just put one more scoop in there and add another half a cup of milk, then that's not way too much milk, and it still fixes the problem. So again, this is the idea of um, it's just kind of building up your ratio table. And we'll go to the ratio box, and then Alan had a good comment, too, about um, the ratio boxes. And I think what might be a good time to do is let Alan talk about any of these things we've looked at so far. So this one's actually simpler, simpler in some ways than the um, lemonade problem, because I have my perfect recipe here, four scoops to one cup of milk. It's easy to get back here. All i got to do is divide by four, so I can divide by four here. Now, notice that's not one of the solutions that was in my table, right? I didn't say if I have five scoops. I said, well, I could put one more scoop in there and use the one and a half cups of milk, which I think is the way Dan Meyer actually fixes the problem in his three acts. He has three acts, um, several problems that have these three acts where he sets up the problem, there's an issue, he fixes the problem, and then he kind of sets the stage for a future question. So in this particular case, with my ratio table, I can fix the problem without adding more chocolate. All i got to do is add a quarter cup of milk. Similarly, if I look down the rows instead, if I go from four to five, one way to get from four to five is to divide by four and multiply by five. Similarly here, if I divide by four and multiply by five, that would fill in this blank as five fourths. So um, Alan, would, be, would it be a good time now for you to kind of, uh, I think it would be better for you to actually say that last comment as opposed to um, just have us read it. Can you hear me at this point? I'm unmuted. Let's see. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, a couple of things I was just going to say to that is, uh, as Maria was saying, uh, early on when kids are working through these kinds of relationships, their typical strategy really is to build up or to uh, break down equal partition. So they'll multiply by two, they'll double it, then they'll double the double, and then they'll have it and that kind of thing. And then they start going for the in-betweens because, lo and behold, doing the whole number multiplication, you're, you're likely to skip something that is the problematic that's sitting in front of you. Um, so that's, and once they understand the, the multiplicative relationships between the rows of the ratio box and between the columns of the ratio box, the covariation or the correspondence relationships, um, they begin to understand that they have to find a way, a, a multiplicative joint for um, for getting to the unknown. So as Maria was explaining, that's exactly it's exactly the kind of strategies. But one thing to notice in that, if you can go back uh, to the ratio box you were showing just a moment ago, Maria, one thing you'll notice is that in going vertically from four to five and from one to the unknown, dividing by four and multiplying by five, and voila, you have multiplication and division of fractions. And when they figure out, start when 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 that comes into play in these ratio boxes, the multiplicative relationships of fractions, numerators, and denominators, and the relationships of that as an operator to the ratio uh, becomes a tool that students start start to more readily use and reason about themselves. Uh, let's see. Any other questions that uh, you wanted to think about? Okay, so that's all I was going to comment on that at this point. 
Um, so if anybody has any particular questions, then I'll, uh, I can see those in the chat at this point. Otherwise, I'd turn it back to Maria. So feel free to ask questions and if you want to specify Alan, uh, to Alan, that would be great. My students oh. shy away from fractions. Yeah, yeah, I see that from Patricia. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's interesting because from our perspective, we always we always like to approach fractions as a subset of ratios. And we can get into that discussion as well because fractions, it's, it's all about the referent unit with fractions. You can, for instance, you can compare fractions as numbers, but there's always an implicit understanding or an implicit fact that what you're referring to is a fraction of one compared to a different fraction of one and which of those is larger. When you step into the, the larger context of the ratio world, now you're talking more typically about either the same quantity, it could be length to length when you're comparing conversions, for example, it could be yards to feet kind of thing, um, or you're comparing different quantities in, as, the, as the problem we have in front of us here. Uh, scoops of chocolate to cups of milk, then your referent units become the quantities themselves, but you don't have a single referent unit for the entire ratio. You have two different referent units, and that's what makes ratios a, a uh, larger, more inclusive case of fractions. Fractions are really a subset of ratios because they refer to the same referent unit. It's always, it always has to be a fraction of something. You have to understand what that something is that that fraction refers to. Uh, unit rate and ratios was difficult, right? And the ratio box for algebra one and the regular geometry students. Okay. Yeah. So these are these are what you're noticing with the experiences in your own, with your own students in your classes, and the real the huge part of the part of the key of understanding ratios for kids is recognizing that you're moving multiplicatively between the rows and between the columns and the values of those multipliers between the rows is typically different than the multiple, except in very special cases, uh, individual values. The, the multiplier, the correspondence multiplier, the movement left to right is a different factor than the movement up or down. But the movement up or down on either side is always the same. If you do one thing to one, um, one side of the ratio box, you have to do the same thing to the other side of the ratio box, which is the, the one of the major concepts of ratio is that the 4 to 1, for example, in the ratio box is a proportion, and that the any other proportion has to main, be maintained through uh, the same factor on both sides of the proportion. So if you're multiplying by 5, uh, if you're multiplying the number of scoops by five, you have to num multiply the number of cups of milk by five in order to keep that ratio, those proportions, invariant in relation to uh, through multiplication. So this is part of part of the aspect of what we tend to refer as um, getting students to move comfortably and flexibly in multiplicative space, and it's very distinct from additive space. Yeah, and there yes, was a comment. Just, just like keeping balance in equations, exactly. It's the exact, exactly that same principle. Okay, I think we'll keep moving then. Sure, sure. Thank you, Alan. Very nice having you here. Okay, so um, we've looked at our chocolate milk example with our ratio box. We can use a double number line to look at that problem. So let's look at that quickly. So if I go back over here to my OneNote file, here's my double number line for my number of chocolate scoops in my cups of milk. And so my recipe here was my perfect recipe was one cup of milk to four scoops of chocolate. But uh, Dan put too much chocolate in there, so we actually need to go out this way further to the right of four. But we can think about, well, how do I get back to one scoop, for example, if I go back to the idea of the unit ratio, what would one scoop of chocolate correspond to? So I'm going to think about where one might live here. And to get from the four to the one, I'll divide by four. 
and I'll divide by 4 similarly. Next, so a cup of milk corresponds to one scoop of chocolate. But Dan made the mistake of putting too much chocolate in there. So how do I get back out all the way over here to 5? I need to multiply by 5. And so I've kind of run out of room here. It needs it kind of tight. I'll have to multiply by 5 and get out here to 5 fourths. So I'll need one cup of milk plus another quarter. So I can fix the problem without adding any more chocolate if I just put another quarter cup of milk in there. So somebody just said that they really like the double number line as well. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because, again, it just gives you a different way to visualize the operation. And also, it really makes me think about how we, a lot of times what we want to do is want to get back to that unit ratio, so that one to a quarter is where we're headed. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint because I'm, uh, we're quickly running out of time. It's been a great conversation though. So um, it's been nice having Alan here. And again, please feel free to type in your um, comments. So Alan just said um, to me privately that it doesn't address the issue of slopes. Good, good. No, um, that's a good point, and what I'd like to do then is think about how we go back to the representation of um, the coordinate plane. So if we draw the, our coordinate planes along the horizontal axis, we put scoops of chocolate. Along the vertical axis, we put cups of milk. I apologize for this representation. It has decimals in here only because of the tool I used. Oops. Um, but, uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have this here. We might just mark one cup of milk here two cups of milk and have these tick marks instead of these decimal values. So I apologize for that. Again, that was just uh, based on the tool that I used to create the graph. Um, so if we go back to Alan's comment about it doesn't really address the issue of slope, now with this, represent this other representation, we can think about slope again because we're talking about scoops of milk. This is my perfect recipe. I can go across here for four scoops to one cup of milk. And even in our table, we noticed that if that meant that if we did eight scoops, we'd need two cups of milk. Or we could notice that if we move across here, again, four scoops, then what we've done is moved up one. And again, I apologize for this representation here just because of the, it's limited by the tool I use. You might not have these tick marks individually numbered, and in which case you could see, oh, well, yeah, along here, this is one cup of milk, and you might not even have these tick marks here to see um, that it's just, I'm sorry, four scoops to one cup of milk. Um, and you can see that preserved in this graph. So it gets us to the idea of slope. The other thing that somebody asked me about was um, constant of proportionality. So I wanted to kind of bring that up because that's a big topic. And it helps us think about um, how we can use the, these graphical representations in the plane to think about the constant of proportionality. Here's the, the um, standard. Identify the constant of proportionality, the unit rate in tables, graphs, equations, diagrams, and verbal descriptions of proportional relationships. The constant of proportionality in a particular context describes the ratio between two quantities. It's essential for students to keep track of the order of the proportional quantities. The ratio in this problem, for example, this is our chocolate problem, is the amount of milk in relation to the number of scoops of chocolate. Therefore, the constant ratio describing the amount of milk per scoop of chocolate is, and that's what I did when I did my double number line, right? I tried to figure out if uh, what my ratio here was where one of these was just one unit, and the constant of proportionality is then a quarter. That is really dependent on how you set up your um, I think of it as independent and dependent variables, but you might think about your horizontal axis versus your vertical axis. Leads us to the linear equation, milk equals a quarter times the scoops of chocolate. So uh, we have a comment here from Grayling. Constant proportionality and rate of change would be very good here since the slope is usually more applicable to graphical representation. So yeah, this is a, this is a great way to bring this in because then we can, let's look at the next slide. So what I've done is set up this equation y equals k times x, where y is the 
cups of milk. X is the scoops of chocolate. So I say K is the constant of proportionality. And so well, if we go back to that idea, this, this uh, constant of proportionality here is if Y is one cup and X is four scoops of chocolate, then Y equals, oh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, one equals K times four, so K is a quarter. And again, that if we go back to thinking of slope, you go up one, or if we do it the other way, I guess, you go <laughs> over four, up one, but if somebody said rise over run, we'd say rise one unit and go across four units. And it supports the translation between symbolic equation function representation and the graphical Cartesian plane is what Alan said. So, I mean, this is what ultimately we want to move towards is this idea of being able to write equations and, you know, kind of get out of these one-dimensional representations. But the one-dimensional representations kind of helps us just look at it in different ways and helps our kids, I think, uh, get their hands on it, kind of really um, internalize it a little bit more. So I think we're running out of time, so I want to kind of flash through these. The, the, one of those slides that I kind of whipped through before was um, I've put in some slides in here in case people want to look at this, these webinars later. Maybe you want to, maybe you're on your own now watching it, but you want to look at it in a, in a um, professional learning community. So I've put in some questions that you could stop and say, well, let's stop and answer these questions here. You know, what is, what, which representation um, might be more useful, and it might depend on the question that you're a, a, asking. How do these representations tie to one another? How do these rep representations move us forward towards these, um, for example, the coordinate plane representation? So, um, so Alan has a comment that K, the constant of proportionality, is the ratio, the fixed relationship between the two quantities. And again, that goes back to what he was saying with that, that proportional um, idea that K is a constant. He's put constant all in capital letters. So uh, here's our lemonade example. Y is the cups of sugar, water, X is the number of lemons. So um, our constant of proportionality is three halves. Again, depending on what goes along the horizontal axis and vertical axis. So these later discussion questions are for you guys um, just to kind of think about how you might use these in your professional learning communities materials. So I'm going to um, switch gears real quick just to show you this real quick example of tape diagrams. I'd never heard of a tape diagram before until I started uh, reading these materials. And this is actually actually comes from the Common Core Tools website. If you go to this um, progression document and go under ratio and proportion, this is the one uh, Bill McCallum's team, uh, those resources have been built by Bill McCallum's team, I, I think. And it has an example of, suppose you're making a punch where you have three cups of orange juice and two cups of cranberry juice. And um, that's your favorite recipe. But uh, you want to know how many types, of, how many of each type of juice would you need if you need to make 15 cups for your party. So the idea of a tape diagram is that, here, let me go to the next slide that describes it better. If your original recipe is the three parts of orange juice to two parts of cranberry juice, it means I got five parts to the whole. And then I say five parts to the whole. Well, if I, my new whole is 15 cups. So if I think about what one part would be, it'd be 15 divided by five. So if I think of these, um, the tape diagram here, that diagram here is almost compartments. I say, well, how much would go in each of those compartments? So each of the rectangles represents three cups. So if each of the rect uh, rectangles here, this one, this one, this one, et cetera, represents three cu cups, how do I figure out how much orange juice I use, how much cranberry juice I use? So I'd say three times three is nine um, of orange juice, and two times three is six of cranberry. I just want to show you that real quick because somebody said, what about tape diagrams? And I really just looked up these materials. Um, actually, they were, uh, I got um, Lou Ann uh, Malik at Chapel Hill was the one who pointed, pointed me to these documents in terms of um, the tape diagram. Um, so Alan has one comment, and I just want to kind of move real quick and let him uh, do his real quick comment. This is, this is just a quick screenshot of part of the hexagonal um, map for the trajectories that is provided on turnonccmath.net. The, the teal ones are all about ratio and proportion. I know you can't read those. But if you click on any one of these hex hexagons, you'll see a page that looks like this that gives you kind of a map, an overall structure 
of the topics. And then if you click on any one of these particular um, sections, it has very, very nice descriptions of um, particular examples and language and just lots of great ideas on how to present these materials. Um, here is just a real quick, uh, another website that I wanted to share that, and I have these at the end too. This is the live binder site. And what I did was I went under um, math tasks, and Dan Meyer has his own page, but there's a ton of stuff here. Really great materials. Susan Shell shared that with me, and I appreciate that. I wanted to show you that. And then this was just the Dan Meyer site where if you look at any of these, it's tied to a particular standard. You can download the videos. He Sometimes he has handouts too. What is the address? The address for these are at the very end. <coughs> um, so again, because we're running out of time, here are the web addresses for um, the resources. There's the turn on ccmath.net, the Common Core Tools. And what we're going to do is we're going to make this PowerPoint available to you on the website. Carol will send you that link. It'll have the archived um, file of this webinar, and it will have the PDF file and a handout that she sent out as well yesterday that has these um, resources on there. So all of these will be shared um, via either PowerPoint or on that handout. I'd put Tad Watanabe in there as well. Um, let's see if uh, somebody said they lost my video, my audio. Alan says, so Alan is back. Oh, Alan's back, okay. Um, Tad Watanabe, I listed him on there too because he has a talk on tape diagrams and he gave us permission to use um, that, of course, it's on the web, and um, that's where I looked up the information about tape diagrams, um, as well as the core materials on the um, Bill McCallum site. So I think we only have three minutes. Um, Laurie Bell says she has a math department meeting tomorrow. tomorrow. Will we receive the PowerPoint by then? And Carol says, yes, as soon as we're done here, we can put the PowerPoint um, and the um, handout and the link to this um, site, I mean this, I'm sorry, the, the archived version for you guys to be able to get to it, okay? So Alan, I think you wanted to, to make a couple of comments. So if you can turn on your audio again. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, we only have a little bit of time, but I was going to suggest that I could I could show you that uh, animation on comparing ratios for different recipes because it's kind of a nice uh, nice way of thinking about well how do you how do you know whether a recipe is whether a ratio is different than another ratio as opposed to whether two different proportions are representing the same ratio. But I don't know if you have time. Oops. Now I can't hear you. <laughs> Let, let's go ahead and do that real quick just because um, it's nice. It, it kind of opens the door to the idea of slope. Sure. Okay. Here is slope. Okay. So let's see if we can make this show up here. Um, can you see that? Uh, can you see my screen now? My. Uh... Do you have to do the share my desktop? Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, there we go. Let's see if it'll respond. I'm uh, not sure it wants to respond to me yet. Carol's going to give you. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought she had already. There we go. Yay. Okay. So you can see this now? Yep. Okay, great. So here's the here's the question. You've got a family reunion and several people made pictures of lemonade and then you had an argument over whose was the strongest. So you have to come up with a way to determine which is the strongest and one of the ways that you can do it is to compare the ratios. So for instance here you refresh your memory that my own lemonade was 8 lemons to 12 cups of water, my aunt's was 9 to 15, grandma's was 6 to 6, and grandpa's was 12 lemons to 9 cups of water, grandpa's a sourpuss. <laughs> um, so um, just from reasoning from the, from the numerical relations, a lot of times you can see that, see which is the strongest, but you may need to, may need to look more closely and get more detail out of it. So um, the reasoning is that grandpa's is the strongest because there are more lemons than water. So once you've crossed that threshold, uh, that's the only one that crosses the threshold of more lemons than water. Grandma's is stronger than Aunt Tam's because Aunt Tam would have to have 15 lemons and 15 cups of water to be the same and so on. 
But if you compare ratios in, and I'll put this on an animation, in the animation way because it's fun to see it that way. I think you can probably still see that when it comes up on my screen, which is, sorry this is taking so long. Maybe it doesn't work. Hmm. It's taking a little while here. Everybody got uh, a little bit of patience here with this? Here we go. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. So if you look at, um, come on now. I haven't done this before with an animation over uh, a WebEx. Let's see what happens. If you're clicking and, oh, sorry, you can't. Clicking and you can't see anything change on the PowerPoint, click at, like click on the PowerPoint because sometimes when you, there it is. Okay, so here's, here's mine and my ratio table uh, for several different proportions. And we're just plotting the points on here. And then you draw the line here so that you know you recognize that every proportion, no matter you, you can double your amount of water and double your amount of lemons and so on, and you get one line that represents that relationship for my own my own um, recipe for lemonade. And here comes Aunt Tams, and she started out, remember, with 15 cups of water and nine lemons. There's that that point, and there's the point of one that you, where you actually uh, split it by three, and here's her re recipe. Here's Grandma's plotting her proportions. And here comes Grandpa's, who has the strongest lemonade we've already determined from looking at the numbers. So when you're looking at the relationship between different recipes, and i.e. different ratios, what ends up happening is that you're rotating those rays, and the proportional, the, the ratios are different because you've got different angles relative to one or the other of the axes. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop you, Alan. Thank you for sharing that. There was a there was a question from Patricia about whether or not you could share that with uh, the participants. You can let me know if you want to share that okay. somehow. Yeah, Maybe. after we get done, let's let's talk and we'll figure out how okay. to do it. Yep. And then um, thank you all very much. We appreciate your participation and your patience with us. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, it's gonna be a couple of a uh, couple of things you'll get from Carol. You'll get. Um, a, a link to a survey as well as link to all the documents um, and so I hope again that this has been helpful for you all and if you have questions or something feel free to send me in email or Carol email. Thank you Alan for being on deck. I really appreciate your, your helping us out. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye.